Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Kate Levesque, and I have the privilege of being the president here at Ursuline Academy, as well as an alum. We are this evening gathering for the third of Ursuline's 75th anniversary speaker series. So once again, we're delighted to have members of our extended community with us, including students, alumni, parents of both current students and alumni, faculty, staff, and friends. The RSVP list indicated that we have folks with us from all over New England, as well as alumni from Wisconsin, Illinois, and the Mid-Atlantic states. We have grandparents with us from Maine and some of our colleagues at our Ursuline Sister School in Missouri. So a warm welcome to all. Coming out of the pandemic year, it's wonderful to have something to celebrate. And our 75th is just that. It's with pride that we look back upon our heritage and all those whose efforts brought us to this point in the history of our remarkable school. And it is with great optimism that we look ahead to the next 75 years for the world needs strong, intelligent women with a spirit of Serbian. One of our hopes for our 75th celebration, which will be going on for 15 months, is the strengthening of our community, renewing bonds and friendships and forging new ones. So it's good to have all of you with us. Tonight, we're delighted to have Mark Shriver join us for a conversation about his best-selling book, A Good Man. As we head towards Father's Day weekend, I hope that all of us can give thanks for the good men we have or have had in our lives for they are truly a blessing. Here to introduce Mark this evening is Mary Beth McMahon, who I'm proud to call my fellow alumna, although she graduated in 1982, a few years after me. Mary Beth is the president and the CEO of Special Olympics of Massachusetts, and also serves in her spare time as an Ursuline trustee. And just 10 days ago, I'm proud to say she was our graduation speaker at our 75th commencement and did an outstanding job delivering a wonderful message to our graduates and their families. Mary Beth, thank you for being with us this evening and thank you for bringing Mark to Ursuline. Well, thank you, Kate. Welcome everybody. And um, to this speaker, third part of the speaker series and with a friend of mine, Mark Schreiber. And for those of you that may have been at the commencement, you know, I spoke highly of his mother and the um, how she was to me a mentor and really kind of taught me to be who I am moving forward. And so, and still are today when it comes to Special Olympics. So I, it's a great, I've met Mark many years ago and um, have enjoyed um, having him as a friend in my world. Um, but Mark is, his day job is working with Save the Children as the Chief Strategy Officer and his uh, other gig is writing and being an author to many books, including the one we're going to speak about tonight, and also a new book, The Ten Hidden Heroes, which is a children's book that's out as well, which um, if you've seen, definitely pick it up. It's a great book. Um, Smart in his um, has always been something that's key to us as Special Olympics, but I think more also as Ursuline, one of our core values is to serve and serve him. And I believe that he got that definitely from his mother and his father. And knowing Mr. and Mrs. Shriver like I did, working for Mrs. Shriver and being in the aura of the Mr. and Mrs. Shriver's faith-based, amazing love story um, is a real credit, I think, to them and to the family um, that you'll hear about a lot tonight. But I did want to share one Sergeant Shriver story that I shared with Mark a couple of weeks ago. And I will say the way I've always described Mr. Shriver is as a gentle soul, but he, um, and in read, I've read a good man quite a few times and I've actually gifted a good man quite a few times in my life. And he is truly, which Mark will speak about a good man. But the one thing that always amazed me about Mr. Shriver was he was just so fun to be around. Um, and he was just truly a gentle soul. And I was telling Mark a story of when I traveled with him in Northern California, when I worked for Special Olympics there, he was helping us to make introductions to different people. And we had a driver for a week um, that he was so good to for the whole week that just drove us around. But Mr. Shriver wanted to go everywhere. Mrs. Shriver would not allow him to go since she was home in Maryland and he was with me in California. So even though I was afraid that Mrs. Shriver would be mad for me, 
some of the spots we took were McDonald's. Um, we just took off places. He wanted to meet people in the all the different neighborhoods of San Francisco. And it was just such a great way to not only to see the city, but to see the city through his eyes. But it never failed that every time we brought him back to the hotel, he looked at me and he said, you need to tip them. And I said, but you didn't bring any bags in. But he said, well, you still need to tip all the people that are helping us. I'm like, but you didn't bring any bags in. He's like, that's okay, tip. So I tipped them. And then he said, oh, no, they need more than that. I'm like, but we didn't have any bags. <laughs> and that was a common theme the whole week. He was just always good to everybody, no matter what walk of life they were from and no matter who they were. And I think that's a really core part of who he is and more importantly, who his son is. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Mark Shriver so he can talk about a good man. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary Beth. You can hear me, right? Yep. I want to make sure my technology is good. So in other words, you're telling me the story that my dad made you pay all the tips. Is that <laughs> <what happened? laughs> uh, I don't know. He's, he was a good man, but I don't know. I guess I owe you a couple of bucks. Uh, so thank you for that funny story. And actually, uh, Mary Beth, um, I was at a, uh, a greasy spoon here that I used to go to in high school. I went to Georgetown Prep, which is a Jesuit school here in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And I went and had breakfast with a friend on Saturday morning. And a woman came up to me and said, are you Mark? And I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, yeah, you know, I saw you uh, when you talked about your dad's, the book you wrote on your dad a couple of years ago. And uh, I got to remember I told you about how your father used to come in here on Saturday mornings and he'd sit over there and she pointed at a little place around the corner and said, he used to always come in here and eat breakfast and order all these pancakes. And he said, just don't tell Eunice that I'm eating pancakes. So um, it was a Big Mac at McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, his eating habits, but he uh, and he did. He had a great relationship with people uh, of all walks of life, and I'll get into that in a minute. I, I want to um, thank uh, Kate Levesque um, for inviting me. Uh, I got to meet Joe a little earlier. Thank you for all the great uh, help on the technology. Um, uh, Kate, you made me a little nervous with everybody coming in from Missouri and grandparents from all across the country. Um, and I'm sure Mary Beth did a great job as a graduation speaker a couple of weeks ago. Mary Beth's on the board. Mary Beth's giving a graduation speech. Um, uh, the third one in, in this uh, 75th year anniversary. I'm so honored, um, Kate, and, and to be included in your community. I know Mary Beth speaks so highly of Ursuline Academy and the great uh, jobs they're doing there. I, I assume Servium, is, is that, if I pronounce it correctly, is Latin. Yes, it is. Uh, I, when I transferred into Georgetown Prep, so I didn't have to take Latin as a sophomore, thank God. Uh, my best friend took it freshman and sophomore year, and then he failed out, so he, um, he can't help me on the Latin part of it, but um, I love that I will serve. I think that's beautiful, and I loved your comment, Kate, about um, Ursuline graduating good, strong women who are grounded in that, uh, in that call, and um, I, I wrote it down and it's really powerful. I will serve is fantastic. And I'm looking forward to talking to and listening from and learning from some students. You know, I know that you've had a couple of great speakers or a, a couple of um, series of great speakers. Father Martin is a good friend, uh, is a real leader uh, on so many different issues, is a great author uh, and funny and thoughtful and uh, very spiritual. So congratulations on getting him. I'm sure he was fantastic. Um, and I know that you you had a couple of other folks uh, speak, um, I guess as a group, right? Um, uh, Sister Ryan, Nancy Schultz, and Sister Krippendorf. So, wow, you've really had some great people uh, speak. So I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be included. So let me just say a couple of quick words about uh, the book and I guess how it, it, it ties into Father's Day. Uh, it was actually published a couple of weeks before Father's Day, a couple of years ago. Um, when my dad died, my mom had died, um, you know, 15 months earlier. And um, my uncle Teddy, Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts, died three weeks after my mom. Uh, and the guy who worked, who Mary Beth probably knew, uh, Richard Ragsdale, who had uh, kind of been like a second father to me, uh, he died. Two weeks later, my mom died. Three weeks later, Uncle Teddy died. You know, 12 months later, uh, my father died. And... Uh, Richard Ragsdale, Rags was his nickname, was in our house, you know, six days a week until, you know, Alzheimer's robbed him of the ability to come to work when I was, you know, probably 45 years of age. So I knew him for 45 years. Um, and I said to my brother after dad died, you know, what, what 
what do I do now? And he said, I said, you know, what, what do we do? And he said, well, just write down a couple stories about what, what dad meant to you. And that'll help you deal with the process of going through his death. So I wrote down these stories and showed them with a couple of people. And a couple of folks said, you know, you should write a book. There's, there's message here. And uh, as I reflected on the message, what I really wanted to do uh, and what struck me the most was, you know, at, at my father's funeral at the wake, uh, you know, a number of people waited in line, uh, waitress from his favorite restaurant, Jean Wilson, who I still know um, from, you know, she worked at Reeves uh, restaurant in DC, you know, waited in line. And uh, she said, you know, your dad uh, he was so polite. He always was so nice to me. He was a good man. And she shook my hand and walked out of uh, the church. Uh, Edwin DeBus, who uh, worked at American Airlines, same thing, waited in line, shook my hand and said, you know, your father was always so so nice, uh, even when he was struggling with Alzheimer's going through the security line, he was such a gentleman, he was a good man. Um, you know, the guy who picks up trash in our neighborhood, uh, Calvin Dove, um, you know, knew my dad a little bit. And um, a couple of days after he died, I was out front in the front yard with our, our kids and he parked his car, walked up our little driveway, you know, whatever it is, 25 feet. Um, you know, wiped his hands on his uh, jacket, took my hand, said, wow, your father was such a good man. Um, you know, uh, he was a really good man. And he turned around and got in his truck and drove out of the neighborhood. And I heard that a couple of times and I had read about dad's life and, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post saying that he was a great man for having created the Peace Corps, um, having worked with Martin Luther King on integration issues in the 50s before King was very famous, um, how he had uh, started President Johnson's War on Poverty, created Head Start, Legal Services for the Poor, Job Corps, uh, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, Community Health Centers, uh, how he worked with my mom, uh, spreading Special Olympics all around the world, um, not only in Massachusetts and across America, as Mary Beth knows, uh, but all around the world. Um, and, you know, what impressed me was not these um, references to his, you know, so-called greatness, uh, but how he handled and interacted with people on a day in and day out basis, how he was good when the cameras weren't on him, how he made an impression on Gene Wilson and Edwin DeBus and countless other people. Um, uh, because there are a lot of great people uh, that, that when the cameras aren't on them, aren't necessarily good. Um, so I went back and looked at um, Kate, you know, my dad used to write me uh, notes. He wrote all of us notes, um, you know, slip them under the door when we were in high school. Uh, about a conversation we had the night before at dinner about a book he had read on Mother Teresa or Ely Wiesel or, you know, what happened in the Orioles game the night before. This is for the students who are here. This is before you had the internet and you had to literally stay up all night to listen to the radio and then you couldn't get the box score or whatever the results were. So he would write, you know, these little things. And then I was in college, I'd get a letter every day. Sometimes they were addressed to all of us. Sometimes just me, sometimes I'd get a letter to all of us and a letter to me. And I, went, I saved a lot of those. Uh, some of them I never opened because I just thought the guy was, you know, crazy, really. He just wrote so much and, you know, reached out on so many different fronts. But I went back and read those notes to try to distill what animated his life, what were the founding principles of his life. Um, and that's what the book is about. It's the structure is built around his deep faith in God. Uh, and it's a faith that demanded acts of hope and acts of love on a daily basis. And that's really the story. And the book is just really, you know, a, a son's recollection of his father's um, story. Um, because I wanted to learn how to, you know, frankly, be a better dad, a better friend, uh, a better husband. Um, and I went to learn from him through, his, through retelling his stories and talking to some of his friends and reading his notes. You know, his faith... Um, as Mary Beth knows, and I'm sure it was true when they were together in California, he went to mass every day. Uh, and I know obviously Ursuline's Catholic school, he's Catholic. My mom went to mass every day, um, you know, seven o'clock at the local sh church. If he had a meeting, he had to get downtown. He'd hit, you know, 8.30 at the cathedral, five o'clock on the way home at, uh, you know, um, Trinity. Um, and I think the fact that he got on his knees every day and prayed and realized that he wasn't God, um, and that he needed help uh, was a, an, a, you know, a, a core principle of his life. Um, and you see that faith um, you know, throughout his family's life. His father moved the family to uh, New York to uh, open up a bank in uh, the summer of 29. Family lost all their money. 
uh, you know, he went on scholarship to Canterbury up in Connecticut, a, a Catholic boys school, went to Yale on scholarship, went to Yale Law School on scholarship. Um, and, you know, there, his family very much involved in um, grassroots Catholic outreach work in not only in New York City when they were broke, but in, in Baltimore before that, and, if, you know, very strong faith. Um, and you see that faith in the letters that he wrote, you know, when he went right into, never graduated, you know, graduation ceremony from Yale Law School, but went right into World War II, fought the Battle of Guadalcanal. Uh, and how he prayed to God as the battle raged all night long and people were dying to his left and it was right, uh, you know, praying to God and so grateful that he lived through that. And you see that faith in work when he, you know, moved to Chicago um, in the early 50s, worked with Martin Luther King um, to integrate the Catholic hospitals and the Catholic schools with Cardinal Strick uh, as the head of the Catholic Interracial Council. Um, you know, this is again in the early 50s. Um, I'll tell you one quick story, and Mary Beth, I'm sure has heard this one. You know, my father uh, knew King, and then when he uh, worked with uh, then Senator Kennedy's campaign in 1960 for president, Dad was put in the civil rights, put in charge of the civil rights unit of the campaign. And um, a couple of weeks before the election, Dr. King was arrested, and a lot of people thought he was going to be killed, literally in jail. Um, even though you know he was obviously very famous, but they feared for his uh, safety. And uh, dad uh, wanted President, then Senator Kennedy to call Coretta Scott King um, and suggest, you know, tell her that he was thinking of her and praying for her husband. And he proposed that and everybody in the campaign said, absolutely not, that's a horrible idea. We're gonna lose the South if that happens. Because King had been told before that elect, or, or excuse me, Kennedy had been told in that election that if he came out for civil rights, um, that, that they, the Southern uh, governors would throw their support behind Nixon. Kennedy, if they supported Castro or King, um, that that would swing the election. It was Castro, Khrushchev and King would swing the election uh, to, the, to, to Nixon. So dad waited until he was in a, in a room, uh, in a hotel room with Senator Kennedy's brother-in-law and the room emptied out. Um, the uh, campaign manager went to the bathroom his name escaped me, he's from Massachusetts, it'll come to me in a second. And dad pops the question to Kennedy and says, hey, will you call Martin Luther King? Um, and uh, his, his wife, Coretta Scott King, and just tell her you're thinking about uh, you know, Martin Luther King. And Uncle Jack goes, I don't have her number. Dad pulls the number up, get her on the phone, gets her on the phone, have the phone call, it's over in a minute. Um, and the campaign manager comes out of the bathroom and says, what's going on? You know, they tell him what happened and all hell breaks loose. Um, you know, daddy essentially gets fired. The civil rights division of the campaign gets closed down. Um, you know, they think they've lost the campaign. And within a couple of days, Daddy King, who was a Republican, Martin Luther King's father, most in, one of, if not the most influential African-American uh, minister in America, um, comes out, he had endorsed Nixon, comes out and says, I'm throwing my support behind President Kennedy or excuse me, Senator Kennedy, uh, that if Senator Kennedy has the courage to wipe away the tears from my daughter-in-law, Coretta's eyes, uh, I'm gonna throw my support behind him. And if you look at the election results from that 1960 election, the African-American vote ticked up to such a degree that most people think that that's what got Kennedy over the, the finish line. And some people have said it was a great political move by dad to you know, do the outreach to the black community and to Coretta Scott King. But I don't think it was a political move as much as it was an act of hope. Um, that here was a guy who grew up in segregated Maryland in the early 20s, whose family had fought on both sides of the Civil War, who had seen segregation in Baltimore City, but who knew it was wrong, who knew that the Catholic faith said it was wrong. And that he thought, I think, that if this guy got elected president um, and that this gesture could try to, you know, 100 years after the Civil War, because that's what 1960 is, you know, it's less than 100 years from the Civil War, it helps uh, heal some of the wounds in the country. So you see these acts of hope throughout his life, you know, the creation of the Peace Corps, um, you know, legal services for the poor, Job Corps, community action programs. I mean, Head Start is, you know, educating little kids so they enter kindergarten, minority kids in 1965, so that they're educated, they enter kindergarten and do well, and then they go to high school and they go into, colleges, 
I mean, come on, giving the poor people the right to have a lawyer in this country so they could sue the government and have the government pay for their lawyer? I mean, talk about the audacity of hope. I mean, these are like crazy ideas in 1965 that are all getting, getting grounded in his faith. And you see these acts of hope throughout his life, Special Olympics. And then of course, love, you know, uh, his 53 year marriage to my mom, uh, which was preceded by, you know, 10 year courtship. Um, I'll tell you one more story and then I'll shush. Um, you know, my brother, Bobby uh, is a little older than me, 10 years older than me. And in 19, uh, Mary Beth probably heard this story too. Uh, you know, Bobby got arrested in uh, 1970, 71 for smoking pot. And it was on the front page of every paper in the country because my father was thinking of running for governor of Maryland. Um, Bobby Kennedy had died a couple years late, earlier. Uh, Bobby Shriver Jr., Bobby Kennedy Jr. were both arrested uh, for smoking marijuana. And um, my father was in California, he came east. Bobby tells the story beautifully. Uh, Bobby was there, he had long hair. Uh, he, he was in Massachusetts when it happened. Uh, you know, they cut all of his hair that day. Uh, and he was told to go see dad that night. He had just gotten in from the airport. And he said, that's a long walk down that hallway. Um, and uh, he said that when he walked in, uh, dad, he said, you know, sit down. Uh, he goes, he looked at him. He said, look, you're a good kid. He goes, you take responsibility for what you did. Don't listen to what anybody else says about you. You're a good, a good kid, and this is going to be fine. I love you. And that's the end of it. And, you know, dad was thinking of running for governor of Maryland, right? And I was in politics in Maryland as an elected official state rep. And if I were thinking of running for governor of Maryland and our daughter, you know, at 17, 18 years of age, had gotten arrested for smoking pot and it was on the front page of all the papers, you know, there'd be a little more yelling, I think, in our house. Um, there'd be a lot more yelling. And I think the point, you know, for me is he understood that that kid, my brother needed support at that moment. And it would have been so easy, especially as a male to yell at him. Cause that's what I think so many of us men are trained to do, you know, yell at your kid, tell them they did wrong, punish them, you know, ground them. Uh, and he loved him. He loved my brother. And I think, you know, Bobby will tell you, it made a huge difference in his life. Uh, that he knew that my father cared that deeply about him, you know, was, was holding him accountable, but cared so much about him that that made a huge difference in his life. So, you know, you see these uh, kind of acts of love throughout his life. I mean, I can tell you more stories, but I, I just, uh, I, I'm honored to be with you all tonight. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be leading up a couple of days before Father's Day. I'm, uh, I know you have a father's club at Ursuline Academy. I know they do a couple of things every year, golf tournament, um, you know, for dads. I hope, um, you know, the fathers stay engaged, continue to uh, love their daughters, support them. Uh, it's such a huge relationship. My mother always said um, that her relationship with her dad was one of, if not the most important relationship in her life. Um, you know, I, I will tell you one last thing. Our daughter, Molly, uh, when I wrote this book, uh, was at Holy Child, uh, Comedy School of the Holy Child, um, which, you know, is, they got a bunch of them across the country. And um, the book is obviously called A Good Man, right? And uh, Molly goes, oh, dad, when I get older, I'm going to write a book about you. I said, oh, honey, that's so sweet. You know, I really appreciate it. What are you going to call it? And she said, an okay dad. So, um, you know, uh, I'm trying these things. I'm trying to, you know, develop my faith. I'm trying to be more hopeful. I'm trying to understand the importance of the relationship with God. I'm trying to be more loving and more joyful, which is what dad really excelled in. I mean, he treated everybody the same, whether it was Gene Wilson, whether it was the president of the United States, whether you were, you know, President Kennedy or whether you were, um, you know, Kate Levesque uh, or whether you were the uh, custodian at Ursuline Academy. Everybody was the same because I think he really believed, as Ignatius of Loyola says, that God is in all interactions. God is with us at this phone call and that God is in the interaction between him and, you know, Gene Wilson at Reeves Restaurant or with between him and Mary Beth when they were tooting around California or between him and, you know, a little kid. Uh, and that that is something I try to remember. Uh, 
throughout my life that I guess I'm doing not very well, maybe not good, but I'm doing okay at it, uh, which is good. Um, so Mary Beth, maybe I'll, I'll stop at that. I don't wanna I, uh, ramble on. I got a bunch more stories, but I'd love to hear if folks had questions. I'm really honored again, uh, Kate, to be, to be with you all, uh, to be with such, such a great school, um, you know, educating strong women who are gonna be of great service, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country and really across the world. So thank you for having me and uh, let's talk, let's hear, let's talk to each other. Okay, and I was gonna actually um, set the rules of the road, but I think Nan Leonard's already started the rules of the road by raising her hand to ask a question. So um, Nan, if you wanna ask your question, go ahead. Mary Beth, terrific job on the uh, marketing behind your shoulder there with the Special Olympics stuff. That was pretty amazing. Uh, you're relentless. So go ahead, who else? I get relentless. So Nan Leonard, I think, and I think I saw her on mute. Mary Beth, just before Nan yep. starts, if folks have a question but don't wanna raise their hand, please use the chat feature and we'll be happy to read your questions off and get them to Mark as well. So either a hand, but if we don't see your hand, the chat feature works just as well. And I also have some of the pre-asked questions that I'll ask as well, but we'll let Nan go ahead. So Nan, I saw you there. Here I am, is that working? Okay. Um, thanks, Mary Beth. Mary Beth um, is a classmate of mine from the class of 82. And so I know I followed her work in Special Olympics because I have a child with a severe developmental disability. And Mary Beth had recommended to me your brother Tim's book, Fully Alive. And I have to confess, when I saw this talk coming up, I, as usual, confused the Shriver brothers <laughs> and thought that it was going to be Tim. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but my book's better than um, all of my books are better than Timmy's books. Uh, I can tell you that. I can, and he's technically my boss, boss. And I could say Mark's books are better. Well, I really enjoyed Fully Alive, and so that's what what. Oh my God, you're gonna for. love a good man. It's so much better, Dan. It's I've already read it, Mark. They uh -huh. sent it to me ahead of time. Uh -huh. Um, so, you know, what I, what I liked about Tim's book, you know, what, what hits home to me in terms of, um, of Serbium and people with developmental disabilities, um, something that, um, you quoted your father when he was, um, giving his, uh, speech, um, when he was leaving the race for president in 1976. Yes. And there was a, um, a sentence that really struck a chord with me. Um, what we need now is not the false security of beguiling promises or befogging rhetoric, not empty and simplistic slogans. We need the spiritual confidence born of confronting openly and honestly the challenges, the terrors and the nights we all know we all must face. One of those challenges is the continuing need to empower the powerless. And that, you know, really speaks right. to me because, you know, for me, the terror in the night is knowing that I've got this child who's essentially uh, a toddler cognitively and is going to need care for the rest of his life after I'm dead. And I'm going to have to leave him in the care of strangers at some point. And so that keeps me up at night often. Yes. And that's why, you know, I've admired your mother's work and Anthony's work with best buddies and really trying to bring to the forefront of our country how we treat the most vulnerable. Um, but I wanted to hear you talk about your, your father's vision, you know, in his presidential run for what our priorities needed to be in terms of protecting the most vulnerable. Well, he, he I mean, it's beautiful. I haven't read that uh, section, uh, you know, in a long time. So thank you for sharing that with me. I mean, the writing is just beautiful. Um, you know, daddy had a guy who helped him write speeches uh, named Coleman McCarthy, who had studied to become a Trappist monk and then left and was a, a writer. And he often said that writing for daddy uh, was like, you know, trying to write. I mean, it, what, he didn't say Shakespeare, but he was like, you know, your father was better educated and wrote better than anybody who ever tried to write speeches for him. And he understood St. Teresa of Lisieux's philosophy, uh, theology versus, you know, Thomas uh, Moore's versus, you know, uh, John Paul II or John Paul II. So it's just the writing's beautiful. But look, you know, Daddy, as he said, constantly ran for vice president, got crushed. 
uh, with George McGovern. The only state he carried was, you know, Massachusetts and DC. He ran for president, got crushed again. Um, so his vision of empowering the powerless is not popular uh, and it's counterculture. And it's, you know, uh, he would never compare himself to the teachings of Jesus and nor would I, but he, you know, believed in feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting those in prison, you know, giving the poor legal aid, uh, giving the, you know, the powerless, you know, giving Special Olympics athletes a venue to compete athletically, which was a way to break down walls of misunderstanding and prejudice against people like your boy or your son or daughter. What, what My son, son. Your mm -hmm. son. And, you know, and that would result in more support for your son because, you know, people could compete in Special Olympics and they could go to work and they could get married. None of that stuff was happening in the 1960s, and it's not really happening in a lot of places around the world. We still have a lot of work to do. So, you know, his his philosophy, if you will, is not an easy one to do. You know, to to treat you the same as you know I treat uh, you know a funder who gives me a million dollars and spend as much time caring about you and that relationship or your son is hard, right? But he did it with joy and it's beautiful. And that's what the way we should be doing because your kid, your son, however old he is, he's not, maybe not a kid, um, you know, is as beautiful in God's eyes as, you know, any other child who's number one in his class or any young lady who's number one at Earthline who goes to Harvard or wherever they go. Um, and they're just as valuable and beautiful and need to be respected. But as a country, we too often celebrate celebrity and power and fame. I mean, that's what this little book uh, Mary Beth talked about. I wrote 10 Hidden Heroes. It's, it's, it's the people who are hidden who are doing the great work of love that keep our communities going. That you know, you have to find in this book. It's a hide and go seek book, like where's Waldo? But instead of trying to find Waldo, you got to find the hidden heroes, the 10 on page 10 and the nine on page nine. Um, so I'm trying to raise those folks up. So Nan, I don't know if your son competes in Special Olympics, does he? Or is he's not able to do that or? He's not quite at that level yet. Same with best buddies. You know, he's, you guys serve 99% of the people with ID, intellectual disability, and my son's down at the bottom 1%. So I know, uh, you know, my mother always said that her biggest heroes in life were uh, parents of Special Olympics athletes and the parents, you know, of, of uh, young and older kids who are participating, not kids, but older adults who are participating in best buddies. So I know that sounds like a throwaway line, but I, I believe she believed it. And I know that at her funeral, there were more special ed teachers than I'd ever seen in my life. Um, so I'm thinking of you, I'll pray for your son and for you. I'm sorry that you're in uh, the terror of the night. I understand that. I, you know, the waiting list that sure is in Massachusetts, like it was in Maryland for your son is outrageous. Our state should be Country should be putting more money into that. And, and there shouldn't be a waiting list for your son, you know, when you move on to heaven. Uh, that, that young man should have all the services he needs. So I'll keep pushing for that issue. So thank you for reading that beautiful quote from dad. And uh, thank you for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I will, uh, Mary Beth, uh, Joe, when we edit this video, we want to cut out the part she said about Timmy's book being, you know, really good, okay? Yeah, we definitely want to edit that. Yeah, we just want to stay focused. <laughs> or my backdrop might not be my backdrop for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have any other ones? Thank you, man. Um, yes, actually, I have one that was uh, sent in. So um, do you now catch yourself before calling someone a good man, realizing the impact of what that statement can truly mean? You know, it's such a it's such a throwaway line. You know, there were so many you know former uh, big shots and presidents that said, "Oh, you know, he's a good man." Yeah, you know, he's a good man, and um, you know, I, I it can be a trite phrase. Uh, I I definitely have found myself, you know, since I wrote this book, uh, using the term "good" a lot more selectively. You know. Um, Again, you know, everybody says, oh, he's a great guy. And again, you know, a lot of great people, a lot of big shots don't care as much um, about interacting in the moment. I'll tell you one other story. When, when I opened up a program working with juvenile delinquents in Baltimore City, dad came to the opening with my mom. And uh, Governor Schaefer came, he was governor of Maryland at that time. It was raining and, um, you know, uh, 
there were young kids in the neighborhood helping out and uh, as we opened up uh, planting trees and bushes around this slabs of uh, trailers uh, that were our office on a deserted basketball court. And Governor Schaefer came and everybody beelined over to Schaefer because he had the money, he had the power. He was a big shot in Maryland. He was the most famous mayor when he was mayor of Baltimore. I looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw a dad over, you know, 20 yards away talking to a little kid who must have been six years old. He was gesticulating, talking away. And dad really liked Schaefer, big admirer of Schaefer's. And he finished the conversation with the kid. I was over, you know, schmoozing with Schaefer. Everybody else was schmoozing with Schaefer. And dad finished his conversation with that kid and came over like four minutes later and said hi to Governor Schaefer. I'll never forget it because, you know, he was focused on that kid. And that kid who was six years old, who was never going to do anything for him or his career, was just as important as the governor of Maryland. Um, and that's goodness. You know, that's reminding his son. It's reminding that kid, that he's as important as anyone. And I think dad, you know, really believed, as I said earlier about like Ignatius said, that that was a moment to spread love, maybe spread a little hope and, you know, see God in that interaction. So I do use goodness and I try to be very select on it, not throw it around loosely, Mary Beth. All right, thank you. Um, and I know a recent, actually not a, 10 days ago graduate, um, Jane McGuire has a question. So Jane, you can unmute. Hi, how are you? Yes, I graduated 10 days ago. It's really crazy. Um, my question is- Are you going to Boston you. College? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh my Sorry. God. Yeah, I went I, to, uh, yeah. You're killing me, Jane. My, uh, my wife and I both went to Holy Cross. We loved it. Oh, Her brothers really? went to Holy Cross and it's our awesome. two kids. Our two kids are, uh, one graduated from Boston College and our boy is going to be a senior there next year. It's a great school. Wow, that's crazy. You should have gone to Holy Cross, Jane. Should have gone. <laughs> Providence. <laughs> uh, all right, go ahead and I, I'll take your question even though you have that Boston College thing in the back. <laughs> no worries. So my question would be, what advice would you give your own daughters on how to live a more faith-filled life given the challenges of today's world? You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, my wife, uh, Jeannie, is the chairman of the board of Holy Child, uh, where uh, Emma, our daughter, is going to be a junior and where Molly graduated. And she had a great line. Uh, she gave the graduation speech like Mary Beth did. Um, did Mary Beth do okay there, Jane? Was she all right? Yeah, she was great. She gave uh, an amazing speech. Oh, good, 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 good. Uh, and, you know, she talked about flipping the camera, you know, that we spend so much time on our cell phones taking selfies looking at ourselves and how we look um, and talk, Jeannie talked about, you know, flipping the, flipping the, the lens and look at, look at our neighbors, uh, look at our friends, have a conversation with them, um, you know, see how they're doing. So much of what Pope Francis, I wrote a book on Pope Francis, which was, you know, huge honor. Um, you know, he talks about accompanying others uh, on, you know, life's pilgrimage. I mean, that's the name of the book, Pilgrimage. We're all pilgrims, uh, not the kind, you know, that, wore the funny hats and went to Plymouth, you know, whatever, a couple hundred years ago, but we're all really pilgrims here on earth together. And how do we spend time with each other and, and interact with each other and, and support each other? Uh, there's a great line that Father Kennan, um, um, uh, Kenna has a Boston College teacher, Jesuit there. He talks about mercy, uh, accompanying people in their uh, joy, but also in their tough times. Um, so I, you know, I think as you go to BC, if you live on, uh, you know, on uh, Newton campus or on the upper, upper campus, you know, get to know your, your friends there. And I say this to our daughters all the time and Tommy, get off the damn phone. You know, uh, I thank God our kids don't do those, you know, games, uh, all those warfare games and all that crazy stuff. You just spend so much time on social media worrying about what other people are wearing and where they're going and whether they're, you know, FOMO and all that other stuff. Um, but we really, you know, the interaction when you graduate from BC, uh, you know, if you have 10 or 15 really good friends that, you know, they're going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, and that's powerful. Uh, but the only way to get to know them is not through sending them a text, you know, 20 times a day, but it's like listening to them, understanding what their issues are, if they're struggling with their parents or in physics or, uh, their boyfriends or girlfriends or, um, you know, what their joys are. Those are the things you remember. Uh, 
Um, you know, you're not going to remember when you took an introductory history. You're going to remember the times you spent with your friends and helping them and the interactions you have um, and going to mass together. <laughs> I mean, at Holy Cross, I know it's a different era and I sound like an old man, but every Sunday night, every, all of our friends would go to mass together. They come back and get ice cream or, you know, drink one last beer before the week grinded you out. And when we get together, it's always, we always go to mass. I mean, I'm just telling you, you know, reunion when we turn 30 years of age, when we get together, everybody has fun, laughs, the whole thing tells stories. Sunday morning mass, boom. And I keep telling my, my kids, friends that pray together, stay together. I'm just telling you. And the other thing you, do whatever you want at BC, but the, the spiritual exercises, uh, which the Jesuits run, best thing I did at Holy Cross. It's a three-day silent retreat. I do them here in Maryland once a year for three days too. Ignatius, one of the most influential people in the Catholic history of the Catholic Church, understood that. So flip the lens, uh, Jane, uh, you know, interact, hang with your friends, get off that phone and, uh, Go to mass because it's uh, the best relationship you have. My, you know, my father's best friend was God. My mother was a close second, but is you know, it's a personal relationship, and you got to work at it, just like you do with your buddies. Thank was, that you. Really, was that a really boring old man answer? No, that was, that was really great. Thank you for the advice. I'm telling you, go figure out. There's a guy over there at BC. I can't remember his name. Runs the mission uh, ministry, and they do the spiritual exercises over there. Think about it, because it is really good. I keep telling the Jesuits they should mandate it for everyone, but they tell me I'm nuts. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's got to bring you along. Um, but my mother was like a little bit like, uh, I guess you all are trained. Um, you know, she believed in service, but she also believed, you know, you gotta, you gotta act. So she always said, you know, the Holy Spirit sometimes needs a little push. <laughs> um, so thank you for the question. Thank you, Jane. And we have a question. The powers are raising their hands. So go ahead. Uh, hey, Mark, it's Kathleen Quinn Powers. Um, hey, how are you? I'm well, and, I'm, and um, Jane, I, I'm a little upset that he basically outed us being at a Holy Cross 35 years. There's no way, no way I'm out 35 years. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. But Holy Cross, a good school, right? It's excellent, excellent. And and um, I will second that on the, on the spiritual exercises. Um, and I will also bring a message to you from Bishop Bill. We were out filming our mass for our 35th reunion who said, why are you having Mark speak? I wrote a book too. I want to be invited. So, so Kate, the Bishop of Springfield has uh, offered himself and would come for mass. Although he said not the 8 a.m. He would prefer it to be the afternoon. But I just wanted to- You're talking about just so everybody knows, uh, my roommate, my, one of my best friends, probably my best friend in high school went to Holy Cross. We went together. Uh, he was my roommate at Holy Cross, and he became a priest, and uh, he's now the Bishop of Springfield, uh, Bishop Billy Byrne. That, so, sorry, that, that's... No, 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 no. He, he wrote a book, and I worked really closely with him on the book, because it's great. It's about five things I've learned, uh, and it's five... It, he gives great talks, Jane, um, and they're all the five things. Uh, every one of his sermons is, is based, not every one, but a lot of them are based around the five things his dog taught him, a yeah. homeless person taught him very relatable. And he wrote them up uh, over at the Catholic newspaper. And I said, you got to publish those things. So we worked together on getting them done. It's a oh, great book. It, it, is, it's, it is, it is, it's definitely worth having and definitely worth having by your bedside to just read yeah, every once in a while. It's great. Five minutes great. Minutes, yeah. Although, you know, a good man is excellent too. So, and I, I we have a, a sophomore uh, rising junior at our salon. So okay. Mary, um, but what, I, what, I what's your name? I'm sorry. Ah, uh, Mary. Hey, Mary. Maybe you'll go to school with Emma. You guys can go to Holy Maybe. Cross together. <laughs> and I think the last time I saw you, Mark, I was carrying Mary at the Red Sox game. That's how long ago it was, almost 17 years. Right. But um, so my question, and I had this uh, conversation with Mary Beth, and we both sort of bonded over this. One of the most poignant and touching parts of the book is when you, I believe you're at mass with your dad, yes. and you talk about how his, you know, the, the, uh, developing Alzheimer's and how you're embarrassed by him. And I thought that was such an unbelievable moment of vulnerability. And I just wonder, 
did you struggle with putting that in? Was that easy to put in? You know, it was so honest and it just, it always stuck with me as, you know, as our parents are aging and as you, as you even just, you know, it's, it's so easy to disregard the older person in front of you in the market or the person that you're working with at work or you're, you know, and how do you, it just, it, it took me aback. And it always, I always think about that as, you know, it was such a great lesson and such a poignant moment in that book. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, I tried, you know, the book, I tried to be as honest as I could. Right. And um, I mean, I think as daddy struggled with Alzheimer's, you know, as a guy went to scholarship in high school, Yale, and Yale law school, you know, it was brilliant, right? And thoughtful and, you know, his mind went away, you know, it uh, just faded over time. Uh, it's brutal. I mean, it's just really hard. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are struggling with Alzheimer's disproportionately affects women, um, you know, and women are disproportionately affected as caregivers. So it's hard. Um, it's also, a you know, blessing. It's hard to see it as it happens, but it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, he, um, you know, so I just tried to be as honest as possible. I mean, I remember coming, uh, you know, after mass, uh, stopping at a red light and, uh, you know, just thought he, you know, he looked like he was on it. And I said to him, you know, daddy, how does it feel? You're losing your mind. Uh, and he was on it that, that moment. And he said, um, you know, I know, but I'm doing the best I can with what God has given me. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> he said, I'm doing the best I can with what God's given me. And it's, you know, I mean, he didn't know that I was his, you know, fourth kid or the, you know, that we had three children and Jeannie was, you know, my wife and all that stuff. But he knew that, you know, and I think that's the way he lived his life. But that's brutal. You know, uh, I mean, it's kind of getting choked up just thinking about it now. It's like, uh, it's hard. Um, but, you know, if you can do the best you can with what God's given you at all stages of life, you're doing pretty good. And it's really important for men, if there are any guys out there, you know, it's like, God, we're all, there's this, this kind of male image that, you know, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you can do whatever you want because you're, a, you know, an American and you're a male and yada, yada. It's just complete BS. And if any boy tells you that, Mary, tell them they're full of it. <laughs> Actually, her father did. Yeah. No, there you go. Yeah. Um, That's dad. <laughs> and you, gotta, you know, every guy, everybody needs help. And I think daddy understood that. It doesn't matter because we're not God. And you know, some guys think they're God-like and they're wrong. And that's daddy got on his knees every day and realized he needed help. And he needed my mother's help. And he needed, you know, the community's help. Uh, I think that's really important for all of us. You know, he could yell at my brother, Bobby. He could yell at me. He could yell at me plenty of times. Um, you know, I didn't do well in athletics. I mean, I did well in athletics in high school, but I wasn't that good. And, you know, I found myself yelling at Molly sometimes. I remember I yelled at Molly once when he had Alzheimer's. Molly loved to chat when she played lacrosse. You know, she'd go down, she was in an attack, and she'd talk with the goalie and the whole thing. And I was going, you move, you got to move, all like this. And he turned to me once in Alzheimer's, he's sitting in a wheelchair and he goes, did I yell at you like that when you were a kid? I was like, no. And it just reminded me, you know, he didn't. He showed up, you know, I was, I won some matches, I lost most. And he was like, he didn't yell, he just showed up and supported it. I still yell too much, but <laughs> that's a good message for all of us, you know, to remember, yeah. especially yeah. In boys dating Mary or Emma need to remember that too. <laughs> we'll be looking for some advice when that happens, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very best. Uh, what else? We got one more. We got you, one more. The people's time. And we got one more, and it's actually, we're going to keep it the Holy Cross theme. <laughs> Tom Ryan? Are we don't you have any Holy Cross. That Jane is going to beat C with that. Beat I know. C. We got to talk to her, you know? <laughs> I would throw a Providence connection in here if I could, but they have Holy yeah, Cross. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, and it's neat to have you talking to a high school like you did at St. John's in Shrewsbury a, a few years back. Um, I think it's Kenny O'Donnell. Is that the uh, was that? Yeah, he's campaign manager. Yep. Campaign manager. Boston. Yeah, sorry. 
uh, that was just, but that was an incredible story, and I'm glad you told it to everyone because your dad didn't do that, as you said, to to, to gain political favors because it was a political suicide. Right. He did it because it was the right thing to do, um, and uh, he knew Martin Luther King. So I, I I'm so glad you you brought up that that story, and I'm also glad you you mentioned the spiritual exercises. Um, uh, because Jane, I think that is something you want to do at BC, and 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 uh, Jane Mark is, uh, you know, his memory is starting to slip a little bit. It was, it was a five day retreat that he did at Holy Cross, five days silent retreat. Um, I know and, it was silent, but I don't think I don't think yeah, five, five days. Hey Tom, yep, he, with a great Joe LeBrand. Um, but uh, the one point I wanted to to, to raise, and I, I'm so glad you talked about um, your dad's commitment to everybody, to, that his interest in and in, in meeting people and knowing them. And, and there's just one quote, this, is, this isn't this is your dad, this is you speaking, um, uh, going back to, to when you spoke to the St. John students. And you said, goodness is more important than being great. And that has stuck with me. Um, and then you follow that up and said, once you strive to be good in small but important ways. And yeah. that is what your dad did. And that is what I know you try to do because I saw you interact with people after the talks you gave up in Worcester. And you treated every single person who came to have their book signed with such, such care. Um, the, the, the person from uh, the bookseller, the bookstore who brought the books was watching you and he said, I have never seen an author at a book signing spend as much time with every person that came to him because you, you stood up, you greeted them and you asked them a little bit about who they were. And then you took the time to write something. And the guy said, I, that's just something I've never seen. So Mark, um, you, you have learned uh, a lot from your father and you've shared a lot with us. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thanks, uh, Tom, it's really nice. I, uh, I hate the word nice, but thank you. I really appreciate that, seriously. Um, you know, Pope Francis had a quote a couple of months before uh, this book I wrote uh, called 10 Hidden Heroes came out. Um, and it's, I'm going to butcher it, but he talks about the hidden saints who live next door, who commit little acts of love that change the history of the world. And I remember reading it and I'm like, that's kind of, you know, overblown. And he's hundred percent right. And it's the end of the book I wrote on him is also uh, that same idea that, you know, there are so many hidden saints, not only on this call, you know, grandparents and students and staff and folks, you know, at Ursuline Academy, but, you know, the little acts, um, you know, Bobby Kennedy talked about it in kind of secular language of little ripples of hope. Um, and I struggled, Tom, honestly, you know, I, I, I go back and forth thinking, God, my, you know, my parents created all this big stuff, Special Olympics, Head Start, Legal Services, the Peace Corps. And, you know, I'm, you know, like a little pisher doing smaller stuff. But I think, you know, ultimately God doesn't, uh, as Mother Teresa said, God doesn't care whether you succeed. God cares whether you act, whether you try. And if you try to, you know, back to Jane's question, if you try to help your friends and that helps in their family life and that helps them do better at Boston College or, you know, Mary at Ursuline, you know, makes Ursuline better for the, you know, the kids in seventh grade who are transitioning in there next year, who are going to look at her as a junior, as some, you know, big shot old kid. And if she reaches out and makes their transition a little nicer, they go home and, you know, they're not beating up their little brother, those girls, or they're nicer to their, you know, little sister. And, you know, it just changes the dynamic in that home, which then changes the dynamic in the workplace for the husband, for the father and the mother. And that changes, you know, it's all this stuff built. So, you know, that hidden saints who live next door, who commit little acts of love that change history, Pope Francis, again, nailing it. I'm a, uh, you know, that's a, I'm a poor man's quote there, Tom, for Pope Francis or, you know, uh, Teresa of Lisieux. But thank you for, uh, thank you for reminding me of that quote. That's nice. Thank you, seriously. All right, Mary Beth, what do you want to do? You want to do one more or everybody I, wants to go uh, watch? I do have one more. And then we the Red Sox or something. You actually just kind of spoke to it a little bit. And actually, I was going to say, like, but the question comes is some families instill a call to service in the next generations, but what your mom and dad instilled in you and your siblings went further than service, they instilled compassion. Can you speak to you and your siblings' compassion and how they are shaped by your parents and how that's being passed on to your own children? 
I think, you know, I'll, I'll do this one quickly because I, again, I want to be sensitive to people wanting to get off here. Um, I mean, I think, look, when you see people, you know, parent, you know, kids look at their role models or their parents, right? And if they see their parents, yeah, you know, joyful, I mean, I don't think my mom and dad ever went to work a day in their life because, you know, they were up, fired up. <laughs> I mean, they were ready to, you know, go to work because I don't think they saw it as work. I mean, they just loved it. Uh, you know, it was almost like, wow, crazy. You know, when they were on vacation, we were never really on vacation. They were working because it was like a way to spread a little love. As, you know, Tom Ryan just said, a little acts of love every day, man. It was like, wow. I mean, if you really believe God is, you know, sitting in your living room right now, and if you got somebody else in there with you or God's, you know, if you believe God is in all things and that's not BS, <laughs> seriously, then you got to be fired up. I mean, it's like God's in your relationship. God's going to be in your dorm room at BC. God is going to be at your board meetings, uh, you know, at Ursuline Academy or, you know, when you visit your grandchildren. It's like, wow, that's a huge gift. And I think they got excited about that. And I think, you know, my sims see that energy level. Uh, you know, I don't think daddy ever missed a day of work until, you know, he couldn't go there because he had Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, same with my mother. It was just like, God, you get to spend time with Special Olympics athletes, learn from Special Olympics parents, hear stories like Nan told us, try to change the system so that Nan doesn't have the terror in the night. Let's go. And, you know, if you're like got that kind of energy, getting fired up just thinking about it you know that's that's uh, you know you kind of want to get into that line of work how do I do it with our kids I don't know you know I think we try my wife and I try um, you know kids do a lot of volunteer work I drag them you know three or four times a year we clean up trash on the main road you know right around the corner I think they think we're I'm nuts but that's okay you know the earth you know Pope Francis calls us to take care of the earth you know, they don't throw crap out of the window anymore in the car. <laughs> uh, and we're reducing, reusing, and recycling. Uh, you know, there's one page in 10 Hidden Heroes. It's all about taking care of the environment. You know, put a guy who drives a trash truck and a recycled truck as, as heroes. So, you know, these small little messages, um, you know, Special Olympics athletes are, you know, one from Israel is arm in arm with one from uh, the United Arab Emirate. I went to the international games. Uh, Mary Beth Wright were in Abu Dhabi. Yep. A, in the United Arab Emirates, it's a country that doesn't recognize Israel. Specifically, when the Israeli team walked in, 80,000 uh, mostly Muslims stood up and gave them a standing ovation. I mean, you're around that positive energy. You're going to put up the, the stuff like Mary Beth does because you're excited about working at Special Olympics Massachusetts. It's like good stuff. And, you know, I put the athletes from Israel arm in arm with the athletes from the UAE because they're showing the rest of us how to be, you know, human to each other. Political leaders are fighting and bitching and, you know, trying to kill each other, but Special Olympic athletes are leading the way. So I think when you see that level of compassion from your parents, from the work they're doing, from Mary Beth in your house, you know, no, you know, I've known her for whatever, a hundred years, uh, you know, you see the Special Olympics athletes, you see all that positive energy um, and you see them going to mass every day and you're like, I want some of that. <laughs> so anyways, I hope our kids get a little of it, but I'm evidently an okay dad and we're going to keep plugging along. And you're so great to have me. I, um, uh, Kate, so honored uh, to be included. Maybe Tom, uh, one day I can get up to Ursuline and sign books in person if anybody wants them and uh, spend some time together. You're really nice to include me on the 75th anniversary. Um, I hope I did better than Jim Martin so I can tell him that. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll turn it, I don't know, over to, uh, I don't know, Kate or... It comes back to me, Mark. Yeah. It comes back to Kate. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark, thanks so much. This has been just wonderful. Know that there's an open door and a perpetual invitation for you to join us here in Dedham. We'd love to have you whenever you're up this way. Thanks, Amelia. Thank this you. has been just a, an inspirational evening, certainly for me personally. Um, wonderful to hear your stories. I had the pleasure to work alongside your mom. I, too, am an alum of Holy Cross and served on the board with her there many years ago. So, Oh, my God. And you still, invite, you still invited me tonight? <laughs>
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh it's good for us all to be together here tonight. And and I love the reminders, the wonderful reminders that we each have the, the power within us to make the world around us a better and stronger place. So we celebrate our faith, we celebrate our community, um, and we celebrate Ursuline that brings us all here together this evening. I welcome everyone to continue our 75th anniversary celebration with us. Um, there are many more speakers to come. I don't know if their books will be as good as Mark's or if they'll be as engaging, uh, but we will certainly be in touch with all of you. And then we are looking forward to some large scale in-person events in the months to come through the next year as well. Um, if you are interested as an alum, a parent, or any one of you in participating or volunteering or being behind the scenes, we have a special website, which is um, 75 years at UrsulineAcademy.net. So drop us an email there and we will happily connect you with others who are like-minded and who are helping us with this uh, year of celebration. Again, my thanks, Mark, for your wonderful remarks and for the inspiration you brought to us. Mary Beth, as always, it's just one more way in which you are invaluable to Ursuline. I have to thank my colleagues behind the scenes who handle the technology and make this all work and do the publicity for these events as well. And thanks to each and every one of you for participating this evening. We are blessed at Ursuline because of all of you. It's our community that makes us strong. So be well, stay strong, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Good night.